Hello, hello, it's Sonny Melendrez, and welcome to the positive side of the radio spectrum. You found it, the Sonny Melendrez Show. Every week we strive to bring you entertainment and inspiration through storytelling, fascinating guests, exclusive celebrity interviews, and it's all delivered with lots of enthusiasm. And wait till you meet our special guest today. And I promise you, you are very familiar with his work. I can't wait to introduce you to him. We're brought to you by Ideal Precision Roofing in San Antonio. You know, it, it happens in South Texas uh, on a yearly basis, usually around March, April, May. It's hail season. That's right. And many times you don't know what it's going to be like. Sometimes the hail is very small or sometimes it is damaging hail. And if that's the case with your home, you definitely want to call Ideal Precision Roofing in San Antonio. They'll take care of everything. Come out, do a free inspection, find out what the damage is, and get your insurance company involved. And then it all culminates with a brand new roof for your home. And there are so many different kinds of roofs now and colors to choose from. So if today or in the days to come you think you might have hail damage, give them a call at 210-485-1553. That's 210-485-1553 or visit them on the web at idealprecisionroofing.com and tell them that Sonny Melendrez sent you. And now, on with the show. Sunny Radio, sunnyradio.com, San Antonio. Well, my guest today is Dean McFlicker. We caught up at the recent Grow Retreat here in San Antonio that was hosted by another one of our guests on the program, Stephanie Schiller. I thank her for introducing me to Dean. Dean was a keynote speaker, and I promise you, you have heard his work because he is an award-winning producer and director of television marketing at NBC Universal, responsible for the marketing of shows like these. This is World of Dance. This is us, Tuesdays on NBC. But just when you think you've seen it all, think again. Days of Our Lives, this fall on NBC. Next Wednesday, one night, one family, one Chicago. Beginning with Chicago Med. His son's really sick. A father that would do anything to save his son. I love you. And on Chicago Fire. A near-fatal collision tears a family apart. Then, on Chicago PD... Your daughter witnessed a murder and she may have been abducted. Let's find her. Chicago Med, Fire, and PD. Next Wednesday. The Voice, Mondays and Tuesdays, starting September 23rd. How's that for a resume? (laughs) All right, here's my visit with Dean McFlicker. So, my first question is, Dean, have you always been a storyteller? I guess I have. I've always been um, a performer of sorts. I've yeah. always um, loved to be in the spotlight. My mom says that, you know, I, I came out dancing and I've never stopped. I've been uh, one of those kids who, you know, when my parents would invite people over, I would hide behind the sofa when they went to, you know, offer somebody a drink or went into the kitchen for a moment. I would pop out with my Donnie uh, Osmond microphone and oh. portable player, and I would put on a show until my parents, you know, came back in the room and scooted me away. <laughs> so I've, I've always been a big ham, and um, I think that, um, you know, part of performing is, is storytelling. What was your childhood like? I had a great uh, childhood. I was fortunate that um, I had very supportive uh, parents, and I have a, a brother and a sister. And you know, for the most part, we got along pretty well. And I was born in Canada. I was uh, born in Winnipeg, Manitoba, uh, and uh, it was a, a great background. My family moved around a lot, uh, and we sort of drifted south to warmer weather. 
So when you start in Winnipeg, mm -hmm. just about any place else you go can yes. be, is, is yeah, warmer. It's like the North Pole. And um, they, uh, we moved into the United States and then they drifted south and ended up just about as south as you can get in Florida. Uh, I ended up moving out to Los Angeles to get involved in the entertainment industry. but. Uh, I think it was great that I had an opportunity to live in a few different places and you know experience different types of cities and cultures and that sort of thing. So it was great. What was your major in college? Undergrad, I was an English major, uh, English literature, and I like to say that it was a broad-based educational foundation. But that's a fancy way of saying I didn't know what I wanted to do. Right. And I figured if I learned how to read and write well, it would probably serve me in any industry. Mm. So tell me about the, the day you arrived in Los Angeles. Oh, man. Um, How old were you? Well, I was, I guess I was 18 years old. Um, I moved to L.A. Um, to go to UCLA. It was a great excuse for me to go to college, but also be in Hollywood. And um, I literally did not know anyone. And so I took a taxi to... Um, the dormitory and checked in with all the other freshmen and it was the beginning of a great adventure and um, I yeah I, I love Los Angeles and I so what got working. you into into the business well I was always a performer you know first at home like I said entertaining my parents guests whether they were willing or not and as a kid I did local theater and uh, was part of you know a song and dance troupe in uh, in my city, and was fortunate to do local commercials. I was a leprechaun. I do remember <laughs> in um, a, a commercial for a furniture store uh, when it, they were having their St. Patrick's Day sale. I was sing a singing and dancing leprechaun at a young <laughs> age, so that was uh, you know my claim to claim to fame early on yeah. and um, you know had always just been a, a singer and dancer and performer and and loved being in front of an audience your dream was to, to work at NBC wasn't it absolutely I mean yes I mean the idea of working at NBC a television station was just you know a fantasy to uh, when I first moved to Los Angeles and you know went to UCLA and this idea of being in Hollywood was just extraordinary to me and when I first after graduating I went to film school I went to NYU graduate film so I moved to New York and worked there for a few years and then moved back to Los Angeles after graduating mm -hmm. and really didn't know anybody in the industry obviously I had met people when I was an undergrad at UCLA but I was an English major, so I, I wasn't plugged into the uh, entertainment world. I had no special connections. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, after film school, I just sort of took any and every job that I could possibly find slowly over the years, working my way up. And did you find that um, when you were working your way up, you had people that helped you along the way, or was it really kind of a, really a struggle? I think it's a struggle anytime you have a dream and, and you're ambitious. But of course, I have uh, so many people who were helpful along the way. Um, anybody who gives you an opportunity uh, when you're unproven and um, you're uh, green in the industry and, and they, they take a chance on you is something that you always have to um, appreciate and be grateful for. It's a lot easier to hire people that you know. It's a lot easier to hire people who have... Um, a deep resume full of impressive experiences and so I'm especially thankful to the the people early on in my career who were like yeah well let's take a chance on this kid fresh out of college and um, and then I was able to work hard and move up the title of your TED talk is how to get what you want you you talk about the inspiration you got and incredible advice you got from your grandmother yes Yes. Um, my grandmother was a formidable woman. 
Uh, I like to teasingly say that she spoke seven languages fluently and English was not one of them. <laughs> but that's not entirely true. She was um, an incredible woman who I admired a lot and very strong, very tough, and she kept her family together during difficult times at the end of World War II and, and um, really overcame a lot of difficulties that have allowed me to live uh, the American lifestyle um, and uh, that I've you know, that I've been afforded because of the sacrifices of my grandparents and the people who came before me. And, you know, grammarly, grandmotherly wisdom is often sure. uh, so amazing. And she just had this outlook on life. Um, and I was always impressed that she seemed to get whatever she wanted. She was able to uh, charm people, convince people, be pushy, to get whatever she wanted out of any situation. Mm. And I just always uh, respected and admired that. And uh, one of the things I talk about in my TEDx talk is I just, I just asked her at one point, um, how, Grandma, how do you do this? How do you convince people to do whatever you want? And she, she just made it sound so simple. She was like, you know, don't, you know, boobala. Sometimes it helps to show the soup in a different bowl. And so she just had this way of reframing things, of, of thinking about things in a way that might appeal to somebody else. And it was a lesson that I took with me and I've you know, always admired. Do you really understand what she was saying when, back then when, she, when you first No, started? no, of course not. It, didn't, it, it sort of, it took years yeah. for that, you know, that message to sort of resonate and to see it play out in my own life. So now you're ready for an interview. You want to get that dream job. Yes. Tell me about that. Um, so again, one of the things that I talk about in my TEDx talk is the real story and the truth of how I got my job at NBC. As I, as I mentioned, when I first moved to Los Angeles, I didn't know anybody. And so I really freelanced around in the, uh, in the Hollywood scene, taking just about any type of job that I could get. And because of film school, sometimes I got hired as a writer. Sometimes I got hired as a director of small projects. But what I really seemed to naturally be able to do was producing movie trailers and promos for new TV shows. It was just something that, that fit well with my personality. Mm -hmm. Again, going back to my grandmother, this idea of thinking about ways of framing things that mm -hmm. might seem appealing to other people, sure. very much in this idea of marketing and promoting. Um, so I, I started to get work doing that, but the problem was it was always freelance. And so I would get hired for a few days to work on one project for one TV station, right. and then get hired by a production company to work on something else. And I've always admired people who have the sensibility to be able to fr be freelancers, because I am far too much of a control freak. Mm. I want to know and what's going to happen and have a plan, and I get really <laughs> nervous. And I did okay as a freelancer. It wasn't as if I wasn't able to pay my apartment's rent, but I was always nervous that what happens if somebody doesn't call, if the phone doesn't ring? Yeah. So eventually, after freelancing for some time, I landed a job interview for a full-time position at NBC. And this is, you know, NBC in the 90s, the home of such great shows, sure. Seinfeld and Friends and Frasier and Law and Order. And it was just a dream come true if I was able to get a full-time job there. Yeah. So I just wanted everything for that job interview to go perfectly. So being the control freak that I am, yes. I tried to think of every possible thing I could do in preparation to make sure that when I got to that job interview, I came across as just the perfect candidate. Right. So a few days beforehand, I went out and I bought myself a new tie because I wanted to look the part. I wanted to look like a producer you know, for marketing and look really put together. And then I thought, I'm going to print my resume. It was the 90s after all. So we printed our resumes back then. We didn't yes. email them. Yes. And I thought, how do I print my resume in a way that looks like a producer's resume? I know I'll go to a stationery store. Now, for your younger listeners who yes. don't know what a stationery store is, <laughs> you guys can think of it as sort of like a small office depot that was filled with bar mitzvah invitations. <laughs> so um, there I am. 
I am at the stationery store and I decide I'm going to find the best paper to print my resume on. So I'm looking at all the different types of paper and this one has some grain and this one is, you know, got speckles on it. I'm trying to think, what does a producer's resume paper look like? And I find this beautiful paper, really thick, thick paper. It seems yeah. very impressive because right. it's so thick and I think this is the one. I'm going to print my resume on this thick paper. It's going right. to be beautiful. All right. Cut to, there I am at my big interview yes. I'm at NBC. It's the moment of truth. I'm being interviewed by an executive vice president, somebody I was very excited to yes. meet. We'll call him Jim. Nice man. He says to me, you know, Dean, I've taken a look at your reel of past work. And I think what you've done in the past is impressive. And now, you know, I'm taking a look at uh, some other things about you. I've called people that you've worked for to hear what they have to say about you and your references all say very complimentary things about you. And right here in front of me is your resume. And I'm taking a look at this resume and it all looks perfect. But perhaps it looks too perfect. You see, the thing is things here at NBC don't always go so perfectly. Working on these projects with celebrities, things change at all the time. It can often get messy. I need somebody who's willing to push up their sleeves, get their hands dirty. I don't think you have the right style to be a success here. Oh. And then he takes my resume. Yes. The one that I had worked so hard on and he starts banging it against the desk going, what is this resume made out of? Cardboard? So, <laughs> oh, you know, I, I walk out of there. I can't believe that I've goofed this up. Well, the following morning, Jim arrives at his office to find a Federal Express envelope from me. This is the executive vice The executive vice who I had just, you know, interviewed with. The next day, he finds this envelope that's been delivered to his office. And when he rips open this FedEx envelope and sticks his hand inside, all he finds is one slightly wrinkled, slightly coffee-stained cocktail napkin. <laughs> and on this napkin... I've written, Dear Jim, it was great meeting you yesterday. I'd love the opportunity to work at NBC. And thanks for your advice about having a less perfect presentation. Jim hired me that day, and wow. I've worked at NBC ever since. Wow. And, and that wasn't, you actually worked really hard on that coffee napkin, You're didn't you? absolutely right. You're absolutely <laughs> right. That was fake sloppiness. You know, it took a lot of attempts to make that dirty napkin look perfectly imperfect. Attempt number four had too much coffee on it. Attempt number 12, I thought the ink was, you know, too stained. I worked really hard to make it seem like it was natural, but it was a form of storytelling. Sure. Sure. And I think that that's sort of the point is, is as marketers, um, as entertainers, as anyone who's working in business, you can think of the story behind what you're trying to relate to your potential customers um, and to your consumers. And isn't it incredible how uh, so many people have a story, but they just don't know how to tell it. And many people think that they're not creative. Yeah. What do you think about that? Uh, everybody, you know, certain people, like, like anything, some people are naturally born athletes and other people, you know, might be born with a beautiful voice, but we all have the capability of becoming better at the things that are important to us. And uh, now more than ever before, we live in a world of media overload. There's more out there for everyone to choose from at all times, which is wonderful because we all get to see so many amazing TV shows and movies and things. There's more out there than ever before. But that also means that we're all being bombarded by more media images than we were in the past. And so for people who are trying to get something out there, someone who has an, a message that's important, that they feel as though they need to share, or for businesses, simply to break through in a world full of clutter Storytelling and the essentials of storytelling are more important than ever. Now, don't you think that, that marketing also has changed? Uh, you talk about the 90s, the, the internet was just barely getting started. Uh, nowadays, you've got everything on your, in your, on the palm yeah. of your hand. Yes. A radio station, a television station, a newspaper. Um, 
how do you how do you tell your story with this incredible device and this this amazing technology? Well, you know, I think when it comes to storytelling, for people to you know, uh, uh, to really care about something, to really pay attention, it doesn't really matter uh, the format as much as the message. You know, there's a long list of dead technologies in the communication uh, graveyard. We can think of eight track tapes yeah. or black and white yeah. movies yeah. or VCRs yeah. or Polaroid pictures. I doubt that you still carry around an iPod anymore. <laughs> no. You probably are listening to songs through Spotify or some other service, but the point is you still listen to music. Right. So the medium might evolve, right. but human nature doesn't change. The reason that we uh, watch Facebook is the same reason that people stared at cave drawings 17,000 years ago. Since the dawn of time, people have been willing to sit around the campfire to listen to a good story. So with your business, it's important to be a storyteller. Absolutely. And, and, and podcasting is a new radio. In fact, any kind of audio is yeah. radio. Yes. You know, like, like you say, you're, you're not only using that, that uh, medium to tell your story, but also to be uh, as creative as you, as you can be. You're listening to The Sunny Melendrez Show. Sunny's email address is sunny at sunnyradio.com. We're brought to you by Ideal Precision Roofing in San Antonio. You know, a lot of people think that they have hail damage and now even wind damage with some of the uh, the storms we've had of late. And there's a checklist that you can actually uh, kind of look out for yourself before you even give anyone a call, like Ideal Precision Roofing. I'll give you some of the things on the checklist. One of them is to assess your roof for storm damage by walking around the perimeter of your home and then even take your phone out and take some pictures and take note of any damage you might see. And this is, of course, from the ground. We don't want you getting on a ladder or anything like that. Obvious signs of damage might include a, maybe a dented, torn, or curled, or missing shingles. Also, you want to check the gutters, roofing accessories, and windows. And though your shingles might appear undamaged, dents in the gutters or roof vents might point to hidden damage that's going on with your roof. Uh, you've got a complete list of the storm damage checklist uh, that you can get by going to idealprecisionroofing.com slash checklist. But again, Ideal Precision Roofing in San Antonio, reliable. They've been doing it for years, and hundreds of homeowners like yourself have been so glad they made the call to 210-485-1553. That's 210-485-1553. Or visit IdealPrecisionRoofing.com. What advice would you have for someone wanting to break into the television industry, say like when you were... Sure. Back in your well, now it is. You know, now it's it's um, it's incredible because, like you said, you've got this uh, these devices in our pockets that are so powerful. You no longer need to work at a radio station to do a radio show. Exactly. You can do it on your phone. Exactly. You don't have to have a TV studio at your disposal to make uh, incredible stories. And so when I talk to, co you know, sometimes I'm a speaker at, at universities as a guest or conferences or things like that. And I always say, go out and do it. You don't have to wait on somebody else to hire you. If you have a passion for it, go grab your friends and make a movie on your iPhone. Right. Um, you need to, the, the practice uh, and the experience of doing it is incredible. And you may not only learn things along the way, but pick up an audience um, at the same time, you can put things on YouTube, you can yes. stream things, you can have your webisodes, and there's a long history, whether it be Justin Bieber or Issa Rae of people yes. who started out, yeah. you know, small and now are titans in the entertainment industry in the more conventional manner. And Dean, don't you think also that when you do that, like you say, go out and just do it, no matter where you are, that your subconscious doesn't really know the difference between I got paid for it. I did not get paid for it. It was a job. It was not a job. You did it, and you've got that experience, and it adds up 
to the experience you'll have by the time you really absolutely. do get a job. You're absolutely correct. And the, the things that you learn through trial and error are much better to be doing with your friends on the weekend than it is on your first job. Right. And so a lot of people in the industry, if you ask them about their background, they were making you know shows with their friends um, in their backyard and charging the neighbors 50 cents to come see their <laughs> musical over the weekend yes. or they were you know you know uh, making webisodes on their phones and that type of thing um, as a way to get started I certainly uh, made a ton of videos and music videos and all sorts of things um, on the weekends before I was ever hired to do so professionally tell me about your creative process I mean what is your brain uh, you see things differently, don't you? Oh, I don't know about that. I don't know if I see things differently. But I do try to always, uh, whatever I'm working on, you know, one of the things as a consultant, you know, when I'm doing guest speaking, um, working with companies, and we talk about, you know, sometimes what are lessons that we can learn, just general sort of tactics of things that you can learn from Broadway or Hollywood or movies or television and some of the greatest storytellers what are things that you can draft off of their success that can be applied to your business? How can we translate storytelling tools that are used in the entertainment industry into storytelling tools that can help market your company or business for success? And when doing that, I often try to think about what is beyond the actual product and what is a reason why somebody may be looking for that product? Sort of the why versus the what. Um, and that's, um, that's, a, that's a fun thing to sort of explore with different people when we're talking about their different businesses. And you've also, of course, worked with some incredible names uh, that people would recognize. Uh, Jennifer Lopez, do you have a high regard for her? Of course, yeah, there's some uh, wonderful people in the industry that through the years I've had the, the good fortune of working with. And um, it's amazing to see a lot of different stars be able to transition between the different mediums like you're saying you know uh, Kristen Chenoweth or whomever it might be starts as a Broadway star but also ends up on television and in films and people who are able to navigate that back and forth because the basis of being a good entertainer or a good storyteller is something that's universal yes Tina Turner Tina Turner one of my favorites when I was young <laughs> I had the good fortune of working uh, with her and uh, tell me, there's a, a story that you oh, shared with right. us. You, You've yeah, got to tell us. Okay, Sonny, you know the right. story already. Uh -huh. So I was young, and I was saying that one of the people often ask me through, um, uh, you know, working with different celebrities, you know, uh, they, they want to know fun stories, and I often refer to Tina Turner as like working with two of the best people I've ever worked with because she has two sides to her personality, and um, in a great way, it's sort of something that I think about as a way to sort of have balance in my life, you know. Uh, we all want to, you know, be able to work hard but also relax and that sort of thing. And as anyone uh, who knows about the incredible performer Tina Turner, she's had longevity in the industry, not just because of her explosive talent, but also, I think, because she is an incredibly zen person. She's an incredibly kind person. She's a very uh, gentle, relaxed person, and it's just in such contra sharp contrast to her performing personality. So way back when, I was a performer and I was doing a show with her in Monte Carlo, of all places. I was a dancer. Um, in like really? A, yeah, yeah. Back, way back when, I was a dancer in Monte Carlo for an opening act for a Tina Turner show. It was incredible. And Tina... The Monte Carlo Hotel in it, Las Vegas? No, actual, no, no. Oh, in Monte Monaco, Carlo. In oh Monte gosh. Carlo, yeah. yeah. yeah um, and uh, yeah, that's a whole other story that I should yeah. tell you some other time. I lived, uh, I lived there and worked there and became... Well, wow. that's a whole other story. Yeah. That's a whole other story another time. So let me tell you about Tina Turner. Okay. So while I was there, the greatest thing was she would come into rehearsal and she is a, like I said, like a caretaker, a kind woman, and she would want to make sure everybody's doing okay. So she'd turn to, you know, the dancers. I was one of the dancers. And she'd say, dancers, have you had a chance to warm up? Have you had a chance to stretch and get ready <laughs> for our rehearsal today? And we'd say, yes, Tina, thank you. We, we, we've been here. We have what we need. Say, okay, great. Musicians, do you have water? Do you have anything you need? Is there anything, you know? We say, they would say, Tina, thank you so much. Yeah, we're, we're ready to go. We're ready for rehearsal. Okay, I'd like to start with Nutbush. Last time we did it, it was a little slow, so please, on my tempo. Ready? A five, a six, a five, six, seven. A cha cha 
Jesus! <laughs> and then she would just absolutely explode like the rock star that she is. And it was, and then you know she's screaming the notes and just powerhouse performer and dancing around the stage. And then she'd stop. She'd say, "Okay, everyone, I think the tempo." was a, still a little slow. Let's try it again from the chorus. And, you know, it was just <laughs> like working with two different people yeah. at once because yeah. as a performer, this just fireball. And then as a person, so calm and kind. Yes. So she's two of the best people I've ever worked with. In, wow. In one. Wow. No, you couldn't have paid her a higher compliment. <laughs> uh, so yeah. back to your TED Talk, you know, um, you talk about the fact that you know you can, you can get what you want if you really know how to have that that correct perspective. Sure. But there are people who might say, "Well, you know, what about when something bad happens? So when there's adversity, yes. how do I get what I want then?" Yeah. Well, I sort of uh, in the TED talk, I talk about the TEDx talk. I talk about that this is a method a problem-solving tool that you can use. I call it the producer's perspective. Mm. And it's where you can filter any situation through key aspects of film producing. And I talk about five in particular that you can use. Obviously, when producing something on Broadway or television or film, there are many aspects of producing. Budget, casting, crew, all sorts of different things. But in terms of using a methodology for problem-solving, I say first concentrate on five specifically. Plot, dialogue, appearance, theme, and editing. I think what's important to realize is it's not a cure-all. I'm not pretending that this way of seeing things is going to fix every problem, but I do believe um, that there's always a way to make even the worst situation a little bit more bearable. Mm -hmm. And for me personally, when facing a challenge, to answer your question more specifically, when things go wrong and rather than getting overwhelmed or completely upset by things not going according to plan, mm -hmm. the confession of this control freak, I'm telling you, Sonny, <laughs> is it's really nice to have a tool for looking at the problem through some sort of method so I'm not just stuck in the chaos. I yes. can say, okay, if I'm going to produce my way out of this situation, or perhaps if you can't fix the situation, if, if something is terribly serious, someone is ill, or there's an insurmountable situation, how can you best deal with something when it goes wrong? It's really a nice thing to have a tool for at least a way to look at it and to have a five-part method where you can look at the situation and filter it through this situation. And you did that when your father got sick. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, when my dad was ill, um, again, it wasn't as if I had this perfect magic bullet, and nor do I pretend that this methodology is something that is foolproof. Instead, when my father was ill, it was a way when my family was in an emotionally charged situation, when things felt out of control, it was a way of empowering um, how we could feel about the situation, and most importantly, it empowered my dad. And in, in doing so, it also empowered you and your family. Absolutely, to be able yeah. to make decisions based on definitive information, all organized in tidy categories. It's a way of just looking at problems or situations. And from a business perspective, it's a really nice tool when you're facing a, a business proposition or a problem, I often say, you know, when it really matters, how, do, how does one take charge of opportunities and, you know, shape the decisions that govern our lives? We all face those make it or break moments, right. whether it be in our business, in our lives, when you have to convince a teenager not to get a tattoo on their face. <laughs> you know, there are those moments where you just wish you had some sort of way of dealing with it, just another method, uh, an approach to problem solving. So the producer's perspective that I introduced in my TEDx talk is a way for businesses as well as people to sort of be able to filter these things through these five points as, as a way to help them come to the conclusions that might move them towards their goals. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, Dean, I, I congratulate you. I cannot tell you what a credit you are to your grandmother, to Thank your you. parents, to your family. Uh, but I great, think the, the, the best uh, compliment I can pay you is that 
the greatest production that you have ever worked on is yourself. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to know you. A pleasure to meet you, Sonny. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me on your show. My pleasure. All right. Thank you, Dean. Well, that's my visit with Dean McFlicker, and I promise you, you'll be even more amazed when you watch his TEDx talk, How to Get What You Really Want. I've got a link to it, along with uh, Dean's website, and more at sunnyradio.com slash show. At sunnyradio.com slash show. Until next time, I'm Sonny Melendrez. And to paraphrase Dean's advice, only you can create your own story. Go out and do it. Bye-bye. That was fun.